Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Esquire Coaching Radio, where we help attorneys achieve unparalleled personal and professional success. And now here's your host, Anne Janet Thomas. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Esquire Coaching Radio Show. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you today as we celebrate and welcome Gay Pride Month. As you know, Esquire Coaching is a national coaching and consulting firm that's dedicated to helping all attorneys achieve extraordinary whole life success. To that end, we discuss the full range of topics from business building to getting a job to work-life balance and everything in between. Today we have a special guest who's going to talk to us about how to leverage the LGBT market in your legal practice. Now, the LGBT market can be a lucrative place for many business owners, including lawyers. The the LGBT community often faces challenges that their straight counterparts do not have to face, and so that's especially true with with respect to legal matters. Now, there's a right way and a wrong way to approach the LGBT market, and today, Jen T. Grace is going to teach us the right way and how we can really teach our lawyers how to be a go-to resource for the LGBT people in their geographic footprint. Let me introduce Jennifer T. Grace. She is a professional lesbian and the CEO of Gay Business and Marketing, an online educational outlet and judgment-free space where professionals can ask questions to better understand business etiquette around working with and selling to the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered community. Entering this field in 2007, Jen first sought out marketing opportunities within LGBT travel, and then she quickly became involved with the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, and subsequently, her more notable work on the local level with Connecticut's LGBT Chamber of Commerce. Today, she focuses her efforts solely on helping business owners and professionals understand the community better through a variety of services catering to the needs of helping straight people better market to gay people. Welcome, Jen. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be talking with you today. Oh, my goodness. I'm so excited to have you. And, you know, we we are really big on diversity and inclusion, and so happy Gay Pride Month to you. Absolutely. Go, go June. I'm excited. <laughs> Excellent. Now, I just want to remind our callers before I dive into questions for Jen, if you have questions for her, there will be time at the end of this this uh, broadcast to ask her questions directly. Simply call 347-838-8719 and press 1 to get in the line. That's 347-838-8719 and press 1. All right, Jen. So let's, you know, this is such an interesting field that you're in and and really an essential one. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved in basically marketing to the LGBT community. Well, it's interesting. It's one of those things that you don't really know where your path is going to lead you until you just start kind of taking chances and taking risks and kind of just seeing where you end up. And that's kind of how I operate. And I've always had a, a clear idea of what I want as the end goal, but how I'm going to get there, you know, it it varies. So as you mentioned when you were introducing me that I I started off in LGBT, in travel specifically, and preparing an LGBT marketing campaign for a specific travel company that I had been working with. And learning about just the LGBT market opportunity as it related to travel was just kind of mind-boggling at the time. And this was back in 2006, 2007. And at that time, I had learned that I think it was $65 billion there were of uh, consumer buying power for the LGBT community just in travel alone. So if we're thinking about dollars and cents here, $65 billion for one industry is kind of remarkable in terms of buying power. So Mm -hmm. learning about that, I began getting involved with the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, and they're a a national organization that really is meant to help build and grow LGBT-owned businesses. And shortly after that involvement, a Connecticut uh, version of it essentially popped up. And I was approached to just kind of come and check it out and help out with their marketing. And 
it really kind of spiraled out from there that I just had such a passion and a love for helping my fellow Connecticut business owners just kind of understand the LGBT community better, even though at that time I was certainly by far no expert on it. But it was something that was really passionate to me. So kind of coaching those business owners on how to be more effective with it, what they were doing. And, you know, it's kind of just expanded out from that period. So it just keeps getting more focused for me to really just make sure that my message is resonating, specifically with allies who oftentimes have very good intentions, but they don't necessarily come across the way that they're trying to. So that's really where I focus a lot of my efforts on. I think that's great. Now, you know, this is it, only recently um, I went to a, a Fortune 500 company and saw all their efforts in really being able to market if appropriately to the LGBT community. And typically law firms are about a decade or so behind the times <laughs> from corporate America. Um, so this might be an area that's a little risky. You know, it might be a little scary for law firms. Talk to us a little bit about how can law firms in particular assess or deal with the risk that might be involved? Well, I would say that if we look at any type of industry or any kind of market, I, I know from personal experience that the legal field does tend to run um, probably a good decade behind like you alluded to. Um, mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, I think that if we're looking at like a large corporate law firm where there's thousands of employees, that's going to be a very different approach versus maybe that more localized law firm that has, you know, 10 attorneys with it or, you know, a couple of partners or something that's not overly expansive. So I think that it depends on what type of firm you're with, whether it's large, small, whether it's just yourself or, you know, just yourself and another partner. And what the challenge is, I guess, in terms of, I guess, mitigating the risk of entering the market is that I think if you're not clear on what your client's needs are, especially as it relates to the LGBT community, then you're putting yourself at a disservice and you're also putting your clients at a disservice. So I would say that it's actually it's not risky at all in a sense because if you have LGBT clients, and here's one of those, uh, those areas where a lot of people will be like, well, I don't have any LGBT clients. And then my response to that usually is that you know of. Oftentimes, they're there, <laughs> just don't realize that they're there. So, you know, if you, have, if you have clients that you're preparing, you know, a trust and estate for um, or doing some sort of, um, like, the health care proxies, all the types of things that go into an LGBT couple that they have to plan for that other people don't necessarily think about or have to plan for, and you don't really know all of that, then you're actually, um, you know, you're not helping yourself in terms of growing your business. So that's kind of how I would look at it. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are actually on that. Well, I, I I agree with you. I think that, you know, it is a very fifty five billion dollars worth of um buying power and it is a, a it's a market that has a lot of different challenges than straight people plus to the extent that there aren't challenges, you know, it, it, let's say it's just a normal corporate transaction, but the person on the other side, the client, is is a, a gay person. Well, you need to make sure that you're not going to do something that would put them off um, and mm-hmm. perhaps foreclose the deal right from the beginning and you don't even realize why. So that actually brings me up to something that I noted in the beginning of this um, of this broadcast, and that's there's a right way and a wrong way to approach the market. Can you give us? Can you shed some light? Um, you know, without giving away the farm, but can you give us some insight on what's the? Talk a little bit about some of these differences, the right way and the wrong way. Sure. So I'm just going to back up a half a second and just let your audience know that the current buying power that was most recently assessed at the end of 2013 is actually $830 billion, and that is just the United States. And that number is staggeringly high, and it's actually – it's in the top – like, if you look at minority groups in terms of buying power, you have – African, uh, Hispanic American at the top, African American, LGBT, and then Asian American in terms of top buying powers of our country. So that's a, a staggering number. And there's approximately 9 million LGBT Americans in the United States, according to some census data and some other 
research. So in terms of the law practice, you know, whether you're local, national, or even international, that's a really big market opportunity that you are overlooking uh, in terms of just not having a concentrated effort to reach the community. But to answer your question in terms of communications, find that a lot of companies, not just law firms, although I, I have worked with a handful of them, they really go out of their way to put this really large effort in place of, you know what, we're going to put together this amazing marketing campaign. It's going to target this section of the LGBT community. This is how we're going to do it. And they spend a lot of money developing a very beautifully crafted plan. But what they don't <laughs> do is that they don't brush up on their communication skills. And this is ultimately, I refer to them as the seven deadly sins of ineffective communication. And it's basically the, the commonalities that I see people make mistakes in over and over again. So the top two, so instead of, instead of giving away the farm, um, the top two biggest mistakes that a lot of people make are making assumptions and really, you know, statements that are very innocuous. You don't really think anything of them, but then you say them. And that LGBT person that you're talking to is completely offended and you have absolutely no idea why. Or you don't even realize they're offended at all. And stereotyping. Mm -hmm. So between those two things, and there's a lot of different phrases and statements that you can say that you could be saying to a potential LGBT client and have no idea how truly offensive it comes across. So if you think of your marketing plan and, and you think of how much it is to acquire a new customer. So if you have a really high acquisition rate in terms of getting that new customer in the door, to have somebody just say something really, um, really not carefully thought out and that be the thing that actually offends them and they walk out the door and they don't do business with you, how tragic is that in the grand scheme of things? It's really, it's terrible to see happen, and it happens a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have, like, a, a common example of that, like something that's that's uttered that really shouldn't be uttered? Yeah, there's, a, there's I have plenty of examples, and I, I write about <laughs> I figured you'd do. <laughs> um, and it's what I do for a living, so it's actually really fascinating to just kind of be a fly on the wall in other people's conversations and hear and watch the exchange and, and see how things go and then be able to use that as a case study on my website, which I do quite frequently. But one of them is talking about gay lifestyle. And I, mm -hmm. I think you and I have actually had this conversation offline as it relates to the gay lifestyle. So for the benefit of your audience, if you're listening to this and you're sitting down with one of your clients and you are maybe talking with uh, two women who are married and you're referring to them as having a gay lifestyle, I can be willing to bet almost anything that you're not going to get that sale. And they're going to walk out of your office without having done business with you. Because while if you're thinking about the term lifestyle, it, it seems harmless, right? There's nothing really wrong with that phrase. But what you're saying is that those two women that are sitting in front of you as your potential client, you're, you're directly saying to them that you think that they're being lesbians is actually a choice. These lifestyles mm -hmm. are things that we are that we make choices about. So I always use the example that I live an active lifestyle, actively choosing to be active. I'm not actively choosing to be a lesbian. It's just who I am. So and it's something so that's simple, good. right? That people never think of. So it's, it's one of those things that that's probably one of the the biggest culprits at the top of the heap. Is uh, certainly that. That's a that's a great that's a great example. And I think the other thing too. I mean that that's important for our listeners to get is you know, lately some of the some of the larger law firms in particular have been making really big strides in diversity and inclusion and trying to um recruit LGBT attorneys to to be on board. And I think that's wonderful, but that is not the same as you know assuming that they will know how to market to the community or know that, that they can be the voice for the entire community. I mean have you ever come across anything like that when you deal with your <laughs> clients? Yes, and I laugh because that's one of those other, like, really tragic pitfalls that I see a lot of people get into. And it's kind of like putting the weight of the world, especially if you're in a large firm where you have, you know, thousands of thousands of employees, thousands of attorneys, and you have, like, maybe three who are LGBT and they're out. And you mm -hmm. just expect because they're LGBT that they know everything about the community, that they are, like, the in-house expert, all things LGBT. <laughs> and 
that clearly can't possibly be the case. Not every LGBT person is paying attention to every little thing that's happening. I happen to do it what I do for a living, but if you talk to, you know, nine out of ten LGBT people, I would say, you know, like, or talk to ten LGBT people, half of them are probably really clued into what's going on. The other half are probably, they know of a little bit, but they're certainly not experts. So you can't you can't rely on those people in your office or in your building to kind of be that expert. And I think that it kind of plays to one of those um, stereotypes, assumptions, all that, is that your coworkers, if you're in a large environment, just because someone's gay does not mean that they know every other gay person that's in the building. And that's something that I see a lot of, <laughs> especially as it relates to recruiting, where they think like, oh, perfect. Anne's a lesbian, she's totally going to know where all the other lesbians are here. And it seems so erratic. Like, she can recruit the other gays. Like, there's got to be a way. And it just makes me laugh because people actually think like this. And it's just a matter of kind of, like, reframing that conversation for them to say, hey, just because somebody's part of the community doesn't mean that they can, you know, spot the LGBT person in the lineup. That's just not how it works. (laughs) Right. Oh, but but we have gaydar. I mean, we should. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yes, I covered gaydar extensively on my website. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now, okay. Now let's talk about some of the do's. Let's talk about what what's a good way to market specifically to the LGBT community. So my number one recommendation is. If you are going to put any type of effort into marketing to the community, to not make that effort a standalone thing that's kind of outside of what you're doing in your day-to-day practice. So if you have a marketing plan, you want to incorporate LGBT people into that existing plan versus creating a separate LGBT marketing plan. I don't know if if that kind of makes sense out of the gate, but essentially... Oh, it does. so what you want to do is if you're advertising in, I don't know, like I live in the Hartford area, so the Hartford Current or the Hartford Business Journal, if I were advising a law firm here to put an ad in there, I would just say, hey, whoever you're already using, whatever couple is already in there, if you're a family, a family practice, just throw an LGBT family in there with the other families that you already have. I'm not telling you to just create a new ad that just has LGBT people in it and will only go in an LGBT publication, but rather you want to be inclusion, based on inclusion. So I call it inclusion-based marketing. It's really the, the best way to do it because it kind of shows that you're not trying to hide the fact that you are marketing to the LGBT community, but you're including LGBT people into into what you're doing daily already. And that's really kind of the best approach to take because it's it's what LGBT people want to see. They don't want to see that they're being marketed to separately. It's like that whole separate but equal thing. You know, you want to make sure that you're just saying, hey, you know what, our doors are open. We're open for all business, and we're not going to exclude you because you're LGBT, and we're not going to include you because you're LGBT. You're just another person. Kind of that, that's a, that would be my number one recommendation. What a fascinating thing you just said, which is you don't want um, – you don't want to hide the fact that you are marketing to the LGBT community. And I think that's exactly what ends up happening when you do mm-hmm. these segregated, you know, segmented marketing campaigns. That I never thought about it that way, but it, it makes sense. You know, that way you can you can have your little gay ads in the gay neighborhoods mm-hmm. of, you know, America and then not have it at all anywhere else and feel like, okay, I did it, you know. <laughs> so Yeah, right? Sense. And it, and if you think of, like, diversity and inclusion, there's a whole industry and a field around diversity and inclusion as one lumped group. And if you think about it, diversity is really kind of the practice of singling out people based on characteristics that make them diverse. And then if you think of inclusion, it's a matter of putting everybody back into that same heap because they're including, being included. So it's interesting that those two words are always put together, but when in actuality they're kind of like polar opposite of one another. So I always find that fascinating. I know. There, there's a, everything keeps changing in the diversity and inclusion movement, so now I think there's a new terminology that's starting to pop up. So we'll see where that goes. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, Absolutely. It's really towards inclusion, that's for sure. Yeah, that's right. So before I ask some more questions, I want to remind our listeners, 
if you have a question about how to appropriately market to the LGBT community, now's your chance to call in and speak to Jen directly. Call 347-838-8719 and press 1 to get in the line. That's 347 347- Eight three eight eight seven one nine. All right, Jen. Before you know, I'll wait and monitor the um, the call lines, but I want to keep asking you a few questions. So, now, what would be the first step for a law practice, a legal practice, to be able to enter the LGBT market? I would say the first step is not to prepare the big fancy marketing plan, but to have some sort of communications-related training where you are having that conversation with your staff so everybody's on the same page because you don't want uh, a couple of renegade attorneys in your practice kind of going hog wild on just the LGBT stuff and then have no one else in the firm know that this is happening because you want to make sure that everybody is on the same page, everyone's, you know, singing the same song. But if you and I are part of the same firm and I'm doing a marketing campaign and a big push up here for LGBT in Hartford and you happen to be in Washington, D.C. or perhaps you're in Dallas, Texas, and you don't know that I'm doing that, but somebody, because we're in such a social world, somebody hears that I'm doing this in, in Connecticut, but, you know, I know them and it happened in Dallas. You want to make sure that that person in Dallas isn't caught off guard by the fact that, you know, there's some kind of marketing thing happening. So you want to make sure that they can actually be also singing that same song, whether they're active in doing it or not. That's where the communications come in. Because you want to really make sure everybody's kind of trained at the base level of how to communicate appropriately with the community. So, you know, I cover just a couple of really small do's and don'ts, but there are many, many, many of them. So I would say if you can get on a webinar, if you can get somebody to come in and just talk with your staff, or if you have somebody who's spearheading this effort, to have them be the one that's kind of having that conversation with the employees and attorneys in the practice, just to say, hey, here are the do's and here are the don'ts of making sure that we do this right, because we don't want to spend all this money to get this customer to walk in our door, and then for you to say something, you know, stick your foot in your mouth and have them turn around and walk right back out. So it's really Mm. having that communication foundation built first. Then once you're there, then doing the marketing push after that makes much more sense. That makes so much sense. And it actually reminds me, you know, offline when Jen and I were talking, we basically, you told me your story about when this happened to you at one of your former employers. And it it made a profound impact because all the work that you had done to try to market Uh to the LGBT community was all for nothing, basically. Yes. Yes. And so yeah. I have firsthand experience in almost, I would say like 90% of what I teach and educate people on, I have full experience in having gone through myself or most of the time myself, but if not, that other 10% are people that I know who come to me and say, hey, can you believe that just this just happened? But to your point, mm-hmm. I was working on a really big campaign and I was sending people in the door left and right and the sales staff were just so... They were just inequipped. They didn't have the right information. And at that time, I was not the person to be able to deliver that information to them. But I was sending leads in the door, and those leads were walking right back out because they were offended by the sales staff that I was working with. So, wow. you know, you've got to make sure that all departments are all kind of in sync and they know what's going on and that you're not going to inadvertently offend that customer. Even and most of the time, this is the even sadder part, is that, of the time, the person who's offended that potential client, they didn't really mean anything bad by what they were saying. They just didn't have, they weren't equipped with the right language. And that's Mm -hmm. even worse, you know. That's true. That's true, especially. Now, what what about, because, you know, the reality is we have the full gamut of people who practice law, and some folks really are appalled by the LGBT well, not community, but just, you know, the whole concept of of, of same-sex anything. And so yeah. how how can we really find a way to do this training that you're talking about, to really educate people? But then what about the people who really do not care for this? How do you, How do you manage that? 
It's it's interesting, and I actually did a training in New York City a couple of months ago with a hotel, and I was in front of all of their sales staff, their business development staff, their front end people, and I could clearly see that there were a couple of disgruntled people in the crowd who did not want to be there. There's probably about 60 of them there. And there were a couple in the crowd that that you could tell just wanted nothing to do with this. But Mm -hmm. the company made it mandatory. So it was one of those things that they were very clear in how they they articulated the message. And it was, you don't have to like what we're doing, but you need to at least know what we're doing. So you can walk out of this training today and – basically not do anything with what you've just learned, and that's fine. But you can't be that roadblock or inhibiting your other or prohibiting your other uh, fellow coworkers from being successful at doing it because they want to do it. So it's just a matter of being really candid with them, saying, listen, you don't have to be happy with the fact that we're reaching out to the LGBT community, but you can't be um, – trying to think of the right word. You can't be fellow coworkers for doing it anyway. So it's just because mm. you know you're not going to get complete consensus across the board. That's just that's just life, and that's how it is. But they can't be intentionally kind of sabotaging what you're doing either because, you know, why would you do that, especially if your coworkers are trying to get business out of this, which is only going to help make the firm better. Absolutely. Oh, that makes so much sense. And actually that's a very effective way to handle it, you know. Give the training and then – People are still entitled to their personal views and opinions, and they don't necessarily have to do anything with it. So that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, I know that you have a new book coming out. Will you share with our audience a little bit about it? I would love to. I'm so excited. So I have (laughs) my first book that came out was titled But You Don't Look Gay, and that book was is actually that's one of those lovely statements that I keep referring to that you know if you say that to a potential client they're probably not going to be happy with that type of uh, phrase (laughs) so in my typical fashion when I train and when I am writing I I like to bring a little bit of humor to what I do just because it it could get really boring if not so I wrote my second book which should be out next month in July and it's actually titled no wait you do look gay and it is the seven mistakes that are preventing you from selling to the $830 billion LGBT community. So in it, I go over the what I've dubbed the seven deadly sins of ineffective communication. So I break them down into very, very uh, great detail of, you know, you shouldn't assume. And here are all the different ways that you're making assumptions and you don't even realize it. And then we go into stereotypes. Here are all the ways that you're stereotyping and you don't really, you don't even know it. And it really, and it talks about that inclusion-based marketing that we were talking about before. It gives some case studies and some examples of people who are doing it really, really bad and some who are doing it really, really good. So it's really kind of a a very large, holistic approach to just getting your communication self in check. I love this. I mean, what a fantastic resource. And how can um, our listeners get a copy? Well, you can head over to, I set up a new website actually earlier today, and it's no wait, you don't, um, no wait, you do look gay.com. So you can put it in that way. Or if you just go to my website, which is Jen with two N's, T Grace.com, all of the information is there as well. And it will be available on Amazon in July. Okay, great. I think this is going to be so, such a necessary and a great first step. Now, I know earlier you mentioned um, that it would be important for there to be some communication training or something of that nature. Is that something that your, you or your company can do? It is, yeah. It's actually the stuff that I, I swear I live to do this stuff. It's just so much fun going into a room full of people, even with those disgruntled folks that are in there as well, and just kind of educate them on all the ways they can improve their business and Just to see the results, it's even more exciting when people are actually just using these really small steps in the right direction and they're getting huge results from them. It just shows what what a market opportunity exists for any small business wanting to do this. So, yes, in short, yes, I absolutely do this, and it's the stuff I love. I love it. Well, you know, um, to our listeners, I I highly recommend you approach your law firms or if you are a solo um, or you work for corporations and you know that this is a great market to to appeal to, uh, reach out to Jen. And, Jen, one more time, your website and how our listeners can reach you. 
Certain. You can head over to J E N N T Grace dot com, and that is my website that has a blog that I write to every Tuesday and Friday. That just I have tons of free information on the site, and I also have a podcast which you were kindly uh, kind enough to be a guest of mine on just last month. So I have a lot of free information. So if you just want to kind of get your foot wet, just to just stick your toe in the water, all the information to contact me is on the website. Oh, this is fantastic. Thank you so much, Jen. This was just so much great information. You are very welcome. I'm so happy to have been here and start off Pride Month for you. (laughs) Thank you. So, (laughs) listeners, you know, let's keep this conversation going. Join us on our website, www.esquirecoaching.com. Find our links to LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. And tell us, like, what are some things you're trying to do to reach out to the LGBT market? Or are there questions you have? Let us know. Let's keep this conversation going. And next week, we will actually hear from the LGBT bar about their efforts to try and improve diversity and inclusion um, within our field. Until then, be well, everyone.